I've been thinking about the best DJs in history, from important radio DJs like Frankie Crocker or Jocko Henderson, to innovators like Grandmaster Flash, Africa Bambata, to pioneers of new styles like, say, Frankie Knuckles in Chicago or David Mancuso in New York. I mean, even into the modern day with DJs like Craze and Qbert pushing the art form of DJing to its absolute limit. But there's one DJ who's passed over all too often in these retrospectives, and as with so many moments in music history, we look back to New York in the 1970s. So while Nicky Ciano, Francis Grosso and the like cemented their names as pioneers of the nightclub scene and DJs like Cool Herc and Pete Jones paved the way for hip hop, there are a cast of characters who don't really fit that neatly into the narrative on either side, particularly with hip hop. Where the Bronx is seen as the be-all and end-all of early development, DJs from other boroughs are forgotten or erased from history, and when they're not, they're often misrepresented in that history. That indeed is the story of the first Grandmaster, a DJ who before any other had an outsized impact on the innovations that led to hip-hop and DJing at large. So why is he often left as a footnote? Well, for one, he wasn't from Manhattan or the Bronx, he was from Brooklyn. For two, he was past his peak popularity by the mid-70s. And for three, he tragically passed away in 92, so he can't even defend his own legacy. This is the story of the late, the great, Grandmaster Flowers. You know, the music's nice when Flowers is playing here. I'm talking about Flowers, original Grandmaster Flowers, That's where Grandmaster Flash got his Grandmaster from. Jonathan Flowers hailed from the Farragut Houses in Brooklyn, and his name first appeared in graffiti tags around the mid 60s, often as Flowers and Dice. His debut as a DJ might have come around the same time, but our first documented evidence is later into the 60s, when we see the DJ Grandmaster Flowers in full effect. This was an interesting time in the development of DJing, as venues often weren't built out with their own sound systems yet, so the importance of a DJ was half on his skill in his record collection and half on his sound system. And actually, I'm going to dive deeper into the development of modern DJing, so Subscribe so you don't miss that. Anyway, Flowers came about at a time when DJing really was still in its infancy as an art, and he was a pioneer on the wave of a lot of innovations. He was one of that first wave of mobile DJs in the 60s as venues looked to transition to DJs from using live bands. Both Flowers and King Charles looked to be on the crest of that first wave. He even became the opening DJ for James Brown's Yankee Stadium show in 1968. And then, at the end of the 60s, he was one of the first people to play club music from a sound system during New York's carnival, instead of traditional Caribbean instruments. Both Flowers and Starlight Disco played carnival, and in this way brought the West Indian and African communities together and kind of paved the way for the more modern New York carnival style. He went up against these West Indians. They was called Starlight Disco after Starlight Disco and then they had the parade going on and Flowers just plugged his stuff up and started playing and he tore the whole crowd of everybody that was American came over the, to his side of the park and and that's when I knew he was a tremendous dude. You know, around this time, there are a lot of debates about who did what first, but we can confidently say Flowers was at least the first DJ many people saw who used two turntables as part of his set. Many of the innovations may not have been his, but he was the most popular mobile DJ at the time, and was the first DJ many people saw to use two turntables, yes, but also the first DJ many people saw to use lights or incorporate lights into his show. In researching Flowers more thoroughly, I came across two interviews, one with DJ Tony Smith, the other with Ron Plummer. Both were in the same circles as Flowers and had some great first-hand accounts that, for me, 
shed a lot more light onto exactly why he was the Grandmaster before any other. Starting with Tony. When asked what Flowers was like, he said, he was the best, but he was most egotistical too. He was a bastard. He just wasn't nice to you. He wanted to be so exclusive. He wanted to be the best, and I guess he thought that's the way he had to be, to be the best. DJ Plummer echoes this sentiment too, that Flowers was both the best and very sure of it. If you didn't know about that arrogance, and you listened to the music, and you were into funk, the West Coast stuff, or rock stuff, you really thought he was godlike, fantastic. So a lot of people thought he was better than anyone else. Flowers was sort of like a Jimi Hendrix, he would do everything and you were always learning from him. Flowers was probably the most extreme that I remember, somebody that just knows they're good. As an aside, Tony shed some light here on a practice I know was commonplace in Jamaica, but I'd only seen alluded to in New York. They used to cross out the records, so if you looked, you couldn't even see what the record was. I started doing that. Especially exclusive records that you knew people were going to come up. Maboya and Smith Brothers were definitely more friendly. Flowers had the best music though. He really had a great sound system. The technique wasn't as effective as it had been for Cox and Dodd and his downbeat system in Jamaica, as by the 70s you couldn't really keep a record secret for several years, but they were doing everything they could. Okay, so Flowers was one of the first DJs to play outdoor jams. He had one of the first great sound systems. He pioneered mobile DJing as an art form, he used two turntables earlier than some of his peers. He was the first DJ to play New York Carnival. He was the first DJ to support James Brown. It's a long, long list of accolades. So why don't we talk about him more? With a lot of these early proponents, we rely on first-hand accounts. For DJs like Cool Herc or Grandmaster Flash, we often rely on their own retelling of the story. That's not something we can do with Flowers, as he passed in 92. His legacy has to be carried forward by those who are left behind, and often the interesting story is being told about those who came up behind him, who built on his work. But why doesn't he pop up more into the 70s? He's on a few flyers, sure, and there's a tape circulating from around 1980, but where is the stars of Flash, Herc, Mancuso, Grosso are all rising? Flowers is fading. He fell hard into a world of drugs, and by a couple of accounts had sold most of his record collection by the early 80s just to fuel his habit. According to DJ Plummer, People tried to help him out of this spiral, but to them, it just felt like he didn't want the help. His early legacy was one that he never built on, and the world of DJing passed him by, leaving him as a footnote in a history he really should have written. A tragedy that an important figure, with so much to offer, fell so hard. The veneration his peers had for the skill of the Grandmaster Flowers speaks volumes to the place he should take in DJ history, and we would all do well to remember, before any other, the first Grandmaster. And as always, thanks for watching. I think that one was good, eh? <laughs> Kinda half.